camera is rolling. Okay. Hi, Audrey. Oh, now we have the quiet voice back again. Oh. oh. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, so nice to be here and to meet you. I'm honored. And I would love to ask you about your philosophy of government. Actually, in the United States, um, we find you to be this incredible phenomenon, and it's very exciting to meet you. So what, how, how do you look at the openness and transparency idea of government? What is your thinking? Um, in 2016, when I first became digital minister, I wrote a poem, a prayer. Uh, it's called Job Description. And it's literally my job description, which goes like this. When we see the internet of things, let's make it an internet of beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that the singularity is near, let's always remember the plurality is here. Plurality means collaboration across diversity. Just as Taiwan is caught between the Eurasian plate on one side, the Philippine Sea plate on the other, when they bump into each other, we got earthquakes. But as long as we're resilient, not just in our buildings, but also in the way that we think, then we create this situation where the tension of the bumping together, actually the tip of Taiwan, the Jade Mountain or Savia, grows a couple centimeters every year because of this earthquake. So you see that when we legalize marriage equality, when we countered the pandemic with no lockdowns, when we countered the infodemic without takedowns, it's taking all the different sides, creating the social innovation environment so that we can deliver the responses to the emerging challenges by utilizing all those very different diverse viewpoints. Thank you. That's beautiful. That's soundbite-ish, I hope. I love it. Very <laughs> soundbite-ish and very beautiful. Um, a lot to think about. Yeah, in, in some ways, I'm sure there's a I'm sure there's a solution mm -hmm. for Taiwan's future within mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Um, um, so specifically, you have actually put this into practice mm -hmm. through creating apps and mm -hmm. technology. Mm -hmm. And can you describe some of that? Like, mm -hmm. how does this manifest mm -hmm. in actual government? Because we're all jealous. Because mm -hmm. you're it's so cutting edge, so smart. How you mm -hmm. handled the pandemic? How you've opened mm -hmm. up government? What 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 are you doing? Yeah. Um, so, a year before I entered the cabinet, I was already here as a reverse mentor to a previous ministry in the previous uh, cabinet. And in 2015, uh, when Uber first entered Taiwan, uh, people thought very differently, right? There's people who think it's, oh, sharing economy. There's people who think, no, it's gig extractive economy, <laughs> right? The ideologically, there's this tension bumping together. But we were able to deploy a public code called POLIS that lets people visualize what they feel about in a very funny way. It's a gamification of a deliberative democracy online. So thousands of people, taxi drivers, um, the Uber drivers, their passengers, unions, and so on, all came to this online space to share how they feel. But there's no reply button, so there's no way for trolls to grow. And after three weeks, everybody saw that actually most people agree with most of each other on most of the things. Um, there could be surge pricing, but not undercutting meters. There should be proper insurance, and so on. So after three weeks, we held this online, live-streamed, multi-stakeholder meeting, where we went over those top 10 uh, consensus online, one by one, as the agenda. So by crowdsourcing the agenda, Uber and the taxi union and so on, they all agreed to support the common rough consensus of the people. And then for a couple of years now, Uber is already a legal Taiwanese taxi company, the Q Taxi. But because we changed the multi-purpose taxi act, so even local temples, local churches, they can also form their own Uber-like fleets to serve the people where the Uber uh, fleet doesn't go to. So it's a kind of coordination win that increases the experience for everyone without leaving anyone behind. And is there some, um, oh, sorry. that's fine, <coughs> so if you need to that. cough, cough, no, I have to okay. hold that in, I want cough, to cough, cough okay. when I'm speaking, that's totally fine. Do you need water? <coughs> I have a sorry, cup. I have to wait for yeah. you. Mike, there's mm. water back there. No, no, I'm good, okay. something got uh -huh. stuck. Sure, sure, yeah. sure. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> does this apply to voting? Do you have a way to mm -hmm. better understand the population, what mm -hmm. they, how they would vote? Mm -hmm. Definitely. 
Every year, we hold an annual presidential hackathon that surfaces those new innovations such as polis uh, that may be worked on a township, a municipality, on a smaller scale. Uh, but each year, we choose five teams, and the president herself gives a trophy. The trophy is shaped like Taiwan with a microprojector underneath. And if you turn it on, it projects the president giving you the trophy, very meta, uh, and promising you that whatever you did on a local level will become public code the next fiscal year with all the budgetary, personnel, and regulatory support needed. And how to get from more than 200 ideas to the final five teams? Well, we use a new voting method called quadratic voting. Quadratic voting means that people, instead of waiting for two years or four years to vote for people, um, people vote for ideas. They rank those ideas. And this new way of voting lets people express their synergies better, so that when we choose the top 20 out of the 200 or so, the other 180 actually know which of those 20 has the most synergy with them, and they can dynamically recombine to be uh, working groups with those 20 uh, winners. And so everybody feels they have won, because in quadratic voting, you would not put all your votes into a single project. Um, everybody's got 99 points, and if you support a project with one vote, that's one point, two votes four points, three votes, nine points. So with 99 points, you can vote nine votes, uh, 81, and you still have 18 left, but you cannot vote 10 because you don't have 100 points, right? So most people choose another, vote four, maybe another two, and maybe they pull some back, a seven and seven. So their preferences are best expressed when they vote truthfully, according to their synergy experiences, right? And then uh, once people uh, see the top 20, they, everybody feel they have won because chances are they supported one in those top 20, and the other one that didn't make the cut actually find a way to recombine into the 20 working synergies. So by making sure that democracy itself is seen as a sort of technology, we increase the bandwidth of voting, uh, lower the latency, and connects to more people. So do you know, because I know that um, in the ranking of democracies mm -hmm. around the world, the United mm -hmm. States is actually not mm -hmm. a functioning democracy mm -hmm. right now. Taiwan is a mm -hmm. functioning, probably highly functioning mm -hmm. democracy. Mm -hmm. And when I listen to you and with all the people who I've met who mm -hmm. are in the government in Taiwan, I would be attracted to work in government mm -hmm. in Taiwan. Yep. Uh, and so I wonder how that works here. Does that strengthen democracy to have people diverse backgrounds and mm -hmm. ages wanting to actually mm -hmm. enter mm -hmm. the government? Have, have you experienced, mm -hmm. probably you're attracting a whole segment of the population to mm -hmm. want to get engaged? Definitely. So in the upcoming Ministry of Digital Affairs, already we've got a lot of job applicants uh, from multinationals, from our unicorns, and so on. And it's not that they were not uh, earning a lot uh, from the public market, uh, but they are willing to join the government if just for three years or four years, not as a career public servant, but as an ambassador from the digital world <laughs> to the government. And this is important because this idea of reverse mentorship, the young people join, but they are not interns. They are mentors to the older cabinet members, including me. I'm above 35, so I'm old. <laughs> so we, we really need people younger than 35 uh, to be here and guide us toward this vision of peer-to-peer, -peer, Web3, and things like that, to make sure that we not just catch up, but can actually set a trend to make sure that the technology work where our values are, instead of adapting our norms and values to fit the technologists. Mm. Beautiful. Okay, now let's go to Some a, a, a <laughs> um, unless I've missed something, is, is there anything else you want to mm -hmm. share about what you've accomplished in no, your it's position? Fine, it's fine. Okay, I think that, uh -huh. that's pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. um, China's cyber mm -hmm. warfare against Taiwan, um, mm -hmm. what are you learning about that and what is their strategy or their goal mm -hmm. with maybe undermining Taiwan's mm -hmm. credibility on the world stage and mm -hmm. all of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the PRC um, does the information manipulation in Taiwan uh, not to support any party or faction against any party or faction. What they're trying to do is to uh, lower people's trust in the democratic process because they also have an agenda. They want to push this idea that only authoritarian societies achieve efficiency, uh, achieve economic growth, 
and things like that. So they have something to prove too. Uh, and so to that end, we see consistently uh, that uh, before our elections or during the pandemic and things like that, uh, they want to amplify the narrative that says democracy lead to chaos. Democracy lead to polarization. Uh, democracy lead to people hating each other, and only authoritarian societies are free uh, from these um, chaotic um, externalities. And those uh, authoritarian societies are the most harmonious. Uh, that is the main uh, narrative. Now uh, we counter these narrative not through taking anything down, because if our administrations start taking things down we become authoritarian, we prove their point. So um, during this whole infodemic, this disinformation crisis, the administration never takes anything down. Uh, instead, uh, what we did is called humor over rumor. Uh, we made sure that we work closely with comedians and also with civic technologists that can surface what is the trending information manipulation and just targeting those, for example, uh, there was leading to our 2020 uh, presidential election, uh, there was a disinformation that says the Hong Kong protesters, the young people, uh, with a very scary looking like photo of young protesters, uh, they were being paid two million dollars to murder police. Uh, of course that is not true, uh, but it's very scary. Uh, but instead of taking anything down, uh, we work with international fact checkers uh, who pinpointed that picture to the Reuters photo, so the photo is true. But the caption uh, initially from Reuters was just there are young protesters in Hong Kong. So where does the new caption come from? It came from Zhongyang Zhengfa Wei, the Chang'an sort, uh, the Weibo account of the Central Political and Legal Unit uh, from the Chinese Communist Party. Um, and so uh, we basically just put on a public notice so that when you're trying to share this on social media and things like that, there's this mandatory label that says this message caption is probably sponsored by the Weibo account right, of the Chinese Communist Party. So taking things down actually fuels conspiracy theories. But when you put it on public notice, anyone who shared it understand where the caption come from. It certainly did not come from um, the Reuters. Now, what we're lo also looking at is also to push our counter narratives to out meme um, things, right? So for example, uh, during the pandemic, there was a panic run for a couple of days uh, for toilet papers. And why? Because there was a uh, disinformation campaign that says, the Taiwan state is nationalizing mass production and toilet papers uh, materials are going to be confiscated to make medical masks uh, and so it's going to run out soon and rush out and buy. Uh, and of course people uh, believe that and rushed out and bought it uh, and then there's some photos of people you know, panicking uh, and then the disinformation campaign uh, says oh, democracy only leads to chaos, it's not orderly, it's not harmonious uh, and so on. Uh, but within just a couple of hours, our premier, head of our cabinet, pushed out this meme of himself wiggling his bottom uh, and saying in very large font, um, uh, which is a, a wordplay uh, because twin to stockpile sounds the same as twin bottom. Uh, and so it, uh, he's basically saying it doesn't pay to stockpile because uh, we cannot use that much toilet paper anyway. Uh, and then with a table that says um, the masks are plastic materials domestically sourced, uh, but the toilet paper are from South America. They're paper, they're very different materials. If we just clarify with this table, nobody will listen to us. But the premier wiggling his bottom is hilarious. So it uh, reached the entire Taiwanese population in just a couple of days with a very high basic reproduction rate. So it's like a viral vaccine. People who saw it and laughed about it become immune to the disinformation attack. So just a couple of days afterward, nobody uh, go panic by and people understand it's not the same, the masks and the toilet paper. Brilliant. And that is so strangely in sync with what we were looking at today when I mentioned we were looking at my grandmother's movie and mm -hmm. it's called The Man I Married and the story is she's a magazine executive in New York City. She's married to a German man, they have a son. Mm. This husband of hers needs to go back to Germany during the rise of Hitler. Mm. There are questions about what th that means exactly. Although someone comes into the office and basically says to my grandmother's character, I have a relative in Dachau mm. and can you help get them out? So that's sort of horrifying. She goes with her husband. He's supposed to be checking on his father and their factories in Germany. The father wants to close the factories and just have the money for his retirement. But 
when they arrive, there is a woman who kind of seduces my grandmother's husband into basically becoming a Nazi. So, mm. and it used <laughs> real recordings of uh, Goebbels. It used uh, like real, uh, real f documentary footage uh, of Hitler's rise. And um, oh, it's totally upsetting to talk to you about that. Um, there's an American journalist who my grandmother kind of seeks refuge with, and he basically tells her humor. Hitler has no sense of humor. No government can last that doesn't have a sense of humor about itself. So like the Winnie the Pooh stuff with, with Xi Jinping doesn't work? Mm -hmm. Or what? What do you think? Yeah, I think humor really is uh, Taiwan's antidote uh, to this entire uh, disinformation um, crisis. Um, do you like a, some tissue paper? Uh, there's tissue paper, which is totally not plastic. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, but we, That's have, fine. we have an authoritarian in the United States, and we voted him out, but the Republican Party has become very authoritarian and terrible towards women, and it's terrible that they uh, repealed Roe v. Wade. It has huge implications. And um, actually, I didn't put this in the questions, but um, there's a saying that, it's not a saying, that it's a fact that uh, it's actually violence against women is the single biggest indicator of whether a country will be violent on the world stage. It's not about um, economics or level of democracy or anything else. It's violence against women. And we know the United States is incredibly warmongering and militaristic and, and terrible toward women. It's not surprising. And there are mass shootings like every day. And in China, it's also bad towards women. Maybe you could talk about how people are good towards women here or something. I yeah, know. our, our um, parliament is more than 40% women and our president 100% women. Uh, so um, I, I think in, in Taiwan really, um, when, when I was a child, um, there was a veritable glass ceiling. Uh, my dad and my mom worked as journalists in the same newspaper. And at that uh, time, uh, in the 80s, uh, my mom was still told that uh, she cannot earn a higher salary than her husband. So we've been there. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think things really changed um, in Taiwan, um, mostly because I think this um, mainstreaming of this gender awareness come from the public sector. The public sector started doing gender impact assessment on every single policy, on every single budgetary item. Um, and so even the ministries totally unrelated to economic development and so on, soon become aware of the gender impact, often negative, uh, of their previous uh, budgets and uh, legislations. So after uh, more than a decade of doing this, our entire career public service uh, now internalizes these values. Like you simply cannot have a committee uh, with any gender represented less than one third. And this is just like internalized for, for everyone. Um, and, and then I believe that paved the way for Taiwan to be friendly to 20 national languages now, uh, including the sign language. It paved the way uh, to the LGBTIQA plus communities, uh, the marriage equality. And I'm proud to say that uh, in 2016 uh, onwards to now, I've never been discriminated against uh, just because I'm queer, I'm uh, post-gender, transgender. Um, so I think it takes decade of action, but the public sector need to start and to trust its citizen, the civil society organizations, uh, to follow through. Yeah. yeah. OK. So. <clears throat> I think my next question might have to do with how do we protect Taiwan? Because authoritarianism is on the rise around mm -hmm. the world. Uh, Putin has invaded Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, Xi Jinping has declared a no-limits friendship with mm -hmm. Putin. He's also said that the Taiwan Strait is no longer international waters. Mm -hmm. There are all these kind of ways to read indications that he's planning a potential invasion mm -hmm. of Taiwan. Um, we're trying to figure out how to get the story out, if that will help, how to prevent an invasion from China mm -hmm, of Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to know your thoughts. We, we spoke before uh, filming about how um, 
this idea of democracies coming together to stand up for a democracy in peril, for example, Hong Kong's mm -hmm. system, um, didn't work. Has its limits. Yeah, so maybe mm -hmm. maybe we can talk about that and then mm -hmm. what, what you think we can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think the Ukrainian um, experience showed that um, the situation uh, back in the Crimea uh, situation and the situation with the Kiev, uh, the main difference uh, was this uh, internet enabled uh, mass communication. Uh, and the same principles, actually, notice and public notice, humor over rumor, yeah. was deployed very successfully in the Kiev experience. Yeah. Um, and so uh, usually people think that the authoritarians are great at funding uh, disinformation campaigns, information manipulation, and so on. But this time, uh, not like that. <laughs> the liberal democracies uh, reacted very proactively. Uh, even my grandma, uh, almost 90 years old, uh, one day asked me, was it true that a grandma her age uh, used a can of cucumbers in Kiev to smudge a drone? And I'm like, um, according to our fact checkers, the international network, uh, she actually used a can of tomatoes. <laughs> but, but I mean, of course, there's nothing funny about the war. Uh, but by making that it's trending on the mimetic front, that the Ukrainian. Uh, uh, sounds, uh, yeah, sounds, yeah, sure. We don't, we don't want to lose it's okay, it's the word. Okay. It was actually sound. okay, it wasn't that obvious. Uh -huh. Oh, it wasn't? Yeah, I can okay. fix that in post production. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, we can't, but it wasn't annoying. Uh, okay. So, wasn't you annoying. were very clear. So. Okay, okay, okay. It's okay, still. Okay. It will pass. Uh, just, a, <laughs> just a second. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> I don't know. I have tears smudged. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> mm. It's not bad, Mike? Yeah, no, Sound? I don't hear okay. anything at all. Okay. So. okay, sorry to interrupt you. Okay. So uh, with international support, yeah. it's not just about standing with uh, Ukraine, but actually, for example, the Web3 world three, through cryptocurrency, uh, they actually funded a lot of the efforts uh, from Kiev. Mm -hmm. uh, the previous civilian e-government app, the DIA app, has been transformed overnight through a network of resilience into ways for people to crowdsource intelligence that has a real effect on the battlefield, and so on and so forth. Uh, so by um, identifying, not with this abstract thing that democracy must not fail, but very concrete things, like joining in a democratic network that shares the observations about countering disinformation, countering propaganda, and things like that, it makes everyone involved. And so making sure that everyone is involved in not Taiwanese democracy or the Taiwan model, but rather in this networked uh, alliance of democracies by sharing actively the public code, by weaving Taiwan into the public infrastructure of the democratic world as we have signed on the future of the internet statement and so on. I believe that takes a proactive stance, not just a defensive reactionary stance. Mm. We've both read a book by uh, David Wengro and David Graeber called The Dawn mm -hmm. of Everything, mm -hmm. A New History of Humanity. And um, maybe it also connects with the poem that you began with, uh, mm -hmm. your job description. Yeah. Um, but what I like about the book is it allows us to th imagine new ways of mm -hmm. organizing society, uh, government. It's easy yeah. if you try. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's easy <laughs> if you try. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I guess I'm just curious mm -hmm. uh, what, what you like about that book. I understand mm -hmm. uh, you've also spoken with the author and all mm -hmm. of that. So what were, what were your takeaways from the book that might apply to Taiwan or mm -hmm. the world? Yeah, when I quit middle school, when I was 14, 15 years old, uh, I spent quite some time in the Atayal uh, indigenous nation. Uh, and I learned two things. Uh, first they don't put that much uh, trust in written uh, text or scripture, but rather this um, whole body experience of community together uh, for them is important. And that includes uh, the spirits uh, that are very old, like older than a single human lifespan, uh, including the forests, the rivers, and things like that, uh, or beings like that, right? So the internet of beings actually came from, from that. And the second is that the worth, the value of a person uh, lies in how many lives 
they support uh, rather than uh, how much wealth they accumulate. So just by these two very simple ideas, um, identifying with this community experience rather than written text, uh, and uh, one's self-worth is the network that you support rather than anything you hoard. Um, together, they form this cultural economic viewpoint that are really in line uh, with the internet <laughs> that was just developing at the time. Uh, they share the same root of the commons, of the entire rivalry, of how we both gain when we share something instead of having to make sacrifices and so on. So that experience gave me this whole new vocabulary of describing a new sort of community relationships on the international network. Um, so I do believe that books such as The New Dawn of Everything serves not just as some anthropomorphical um, proof of existence, <laughs> but rather uh, important new vocabularies so that we can start talking about democracy as a social technology, uh, that you can change the layout just like semiconductor design. Uh, and then we can start uh, imagine new ways of doing democracy together. That's not a ritual that we repeat every four years, but rather something creative like canvas that we paint together. Beautiful. Technically, those are the questions I had written down, but you've made mm -hmm. me think of one more, if that's OK. Mm -hmm. Do you have sure, sure. Which mm -hmm. is to um, follow up on your points about mm -hmm. uh, the Chinese Communist Party suggesting that democracy leads to chaos, mm -hmm. or it's, been, it's a weapon of the Western world to mm -hmm. try to undermine their regime. Mm -hmm. Another narrative they use is that it just doesn't work for Asian people. Mm -hmm. uh, can you address that? What is that? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, truth to be told, uh, I do believe that democracy is not about following the Greek protocol <laughs> or following the uh, Washington DC protocol or things like that. Um, it is just opening to the possibility that our new generations uh, may actually know better than we do. And then opening up the possibilities so they have the capacity to change the way the state functions uh, with checks and balances, of course, uh, to respond to the emerging challenges of next decade and so on. Um, con conversely, uh, many authoritarians, um, maybe at their prime, at their peak, they actually function really well. But by centralizing power, centralizing data, centralizing knowledge, it creates a real uh, information asymmetry so that if they want to know uh, what's actually going on in the field, because the journalism uh, is decimated, because free speech and assembly is decimated, there's no accurate view on things. So they tend to interpret new emerging issues from the old frame. Uh, and that only works to a certain extent, uh, beyond which it's very easy to make strategic mistakes, simply because the lens wasn't there, right? So I think uh, on the long run, democracy is an attitude that faces the plurality and say, it's good. It's not chaos that should be uh, shaped into a singularity. And say, there are collaboration across the diversity, so we shouldn't um, decimate diversity. We should celebrate diversity. To me, that's what democracy means. Exactly. Thank you. That's beautiful. Because, yes, just, do you have time for one more? Sure, sure, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, so I think it was Lee Kuan Yew who said mm -hmm. something about Asian values. Mm -hmm. and, and I feel like what you're describing mm -hmm. is the difference between kind of moving forward mm -hmm. with an open mind about the future mm -hmm. versus holding people back and using mm -hmm. the past to control the present. So mm -hmm. in the case of China, it could be Confucian values. Mm -hmm. In the case of the United States, it could be fundamentalist mm -hmm. Christian values. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a very, um, I mean, the authoritarian model, it works on domination, mm -hmm. control, mm -hmm. and hierarchy and competition. Right? Mm -hmm. I don't know what I'm saying, mm -hmm. but I guess you're saying that those are, that, that this idea mm -hmm. that there are these yeah. Asian values, what, what is yeah, that? I, I'm, I'm following, I'm, uh, I'm following your point. Yeah. So, okay. um, so I, I would say that I'm an adherent of traditional Taoist values, uh, which goes back at least uh, as long as the Confucian values. Uh, and, and the Taoist values uh, are anything but institutional. 
right? The, the Taoist idea, the yin and yang, uh, basically said uh, that plurality, uh, opposition, tension, and so on, uh, creates new possibilities. All the new possibilities are created at the intersection between existing institutions and new networks. And we should celebrate the yin and the yang together instead of just uh, saying that the yin doesn't conform to the yang or something like that, right? So, uh, and I think those Taoist insights uh, and amplified by Buddhism into Zen and into other thoughts are as popular in Asia uh, as Confucianism <laughs> or as any other traditions. Uh, and in Taiwan, we celebrate all of them. And I think that is why we were able to, for example, uh, in doing marriage equality and so on, invent genuine new ways of looking at social configurations, uh, saying the individuals wed um, the bylaws, but not the in-laws, the families don't wed, <laughs> uh, and, and so on. So to respect the Confucian idea of family order, but then celebrating this Taoist free spirit of individual to individual um, engagement and then eventually marriage. Uh, and so that is a very different dialogue compared to more uh, Western dialogues about the religious view on uh, marriage equality. Uh, in Taiwan, once we passed the marriage equality law and so on, actually people on all sides start celebrating it more. Uh, it doesn't lead to more polarization. As I mentioned, it leads to the Jade Mountain growing a couple of centimeters after a clash. Beautiful. I can, I can, I can see where all this is putting in the film. Um, final question: mm -hmm. Are you worried about China? Uh, mm -hmm. One of the one of the reasons I think, mm -hmm. in addition to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, mm -hmm. that people are concerned for the future of Taiwan mm -hmm. is because the power balance is shifting mm -hmm. between the United States and China. And mm -hmm. if it's basically historically been the United States offering the greatest guarantee mm -hmm. of defending Taiwan, but now China has the capability to. Uh, Mm -hmm. truly invade and keep the United States away. Mm -hmm. um, should Do you feel worried for Taiwan? Should we be worried? Or, mm -hmm. what, or do you not worry? Mm -hmm. How do you handle that? Yeah, I'll quote um, Bernard Cohen. Um, ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There's a crack, a crack in everything, and that's how the light gets in. The vulnerability of the Taiwanese democracy becomes a crack through which that the light is now shining very bright. We have uh, visitors from the European Parliament, from all over the world really, um, time after time proving that they care about not just the liberal democratic order in the abstract, but this Taiwanese manifestation that provides a veritable lab that pushes, advances the capability of the democratic model. And uh, it shares around the world. Taiwan can help is our slogan, so that nobody would want this lab to disappear. Because this is the place where you produce the vaccination against disinformation, against conspiracy theories, against polarization, and so on. Uh, and so, of course, people also talk about the chips, uh, Taiwan Semiconductor. That's another thing that people cannot afford to lose. But I think over time, by making the Taiwanese uh, model of democracy essential to the infrastructure, to the liberal democratic world, uh, I believe we're among very good and trustworthy company. Thank you so much. That was, I'm doing the praying hands. Yeah. Thank you. you. That was absolutely <laughs> outstanding and mm -hmm. beautiful. And thank you for thank your time. You. Thank you. There would have been one thing when you talked about technology, yeah. um, and because technology is always like a two-sided sword, right? Yeah. So you can, it's a tool that you can use for the good or for the bad. Sure. Mm -hmm. So you think it, that is also one of the fundamental chances mm -hmm. for Taiwan yeah. to, to create, um, well, a limelight on Taiwan, because mm -hmm. in China they're using technology as well, but they're mm -hmm. using it to control the people. I, yeah. While you actually yes. said you mm -hmm. use uh, the, the technology for the people to we kind of control the yes. government. And yeah, the yes, yeah. So um, it's the most clear during the pandemic. Um, in Taiwan, when we say transparency, we mean making the state transparent to people. But in the PRC jurisdiction, when they say transparency, it always means making people transparent to the state. Uh, but if you look at the actual code, it's probably the same open source code. <laughs> uh, however, it's used in diametrically opposite uh, fashions. 
uh, when we're developing assistive intelligence AI uh, to restore capabilities to people who are uh, less um, natural to communicate one way or another. Um, Taiwan is the place uh, where personal computing uh, was become really popular, right? Uh, in the early 80s, uh, we're called the kingdom of personal computers. Uh, so there's a very strong ethos of personal computing. The AI needs to be personal. Privacy needs to be an extension of your own agency. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the PRC uses the same AI algorithms uh, for authoritarian intelligence, right? <laughs> Informing only the authoritarians about where people are, uh, what uh, crime think uh, they are committing, uh, and so on. Uh, again, same algorithm, uh, diametrically opposing uh, uses. Um, but during the pandemic, for a while, especially during 2020, there was a narrative that says uh, it's a necessary evil for the surveillance authoritarian intelligence to work this way in the PRC. Uh, it's uh, mentioned the same breath that says the lockdowns are a necessary evil. It's inevitable. It's the only efficient model uh, to counter the coronavirus. Uh, and then the PRC narrative, of course, wasn't uh, universally accepted, but many people seriously considered that it may be true. <laughs> Uh, and so it falls to Taiwan or New Zealand or other democracies uh, that practices uh, this way of what we call this civil intelligence, civic intelligence, collective intelligence uh, that relies on a well-informed citizenry to invent new ways to do contact tracing, to do mask rationing and things like that to prove that it is not a trade-off between human rights on one side and public health on the other. Uh, it's not a dial that you just go full lockdown or just everybody gets infected. <laughs> but you can actually uh, keep your economy running uh, while keeping the coronavirus at bay. And the only condition is that you have a well-informed citizenry that are creative. So that is, to me, the Taiwan model. Uh, and in places uh, that doesn't like to use the word Taiwan model for political reasons, um, I'm totally fine calling it a New Zealand model because it's the same model. <laughs> but what's important is to prove that a uh, pro-social social media, a uh, pro-democratic use of AI is not just possible, but also desirable to the international community. Thank you. Brilliant. <coughs> Beautiful. Thank hey. you so much, Mother. <laughs> thank you. Great. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. That was great. Yeah, really wonderful. Okay. Huh. Maybe the first interview in my life that I've cried in the middle of. <laughs> this is weird. I didn't know I had that emotion. Mm.